And here we are on Comic Spot. Now, Comic Spot was developed so that this gangster army veteran can vet out comedy veterans. And we have one here today for you to get to know. She is Angie Crumb. Let me read you her intro, and then we're going to get to know her together. Let me see how quickly I can do this under pressure. Okay, she says, so I... I've been dubbed the dirty girl of comedy, rocking the scene for over 11 stinking years. No, I added stinking, 11 years, <laughs> nothing stinking. <laughs> that was my add on. Her quick wit, her sharp tongue and ability to adapt to a crowd has pure, proven she's a sure thing. I took the last part from, from her bio. She says she took the last part from her bio, LOL. You got to give it up for somebody that's been out here serving up jokes like a hero. Give it up for Angie Crumb. Woo! Hi, Angie. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad to have you here. You look like you're sitting in your bedroom. I am. I'm sitting in my bedroom. I was out uh, hanging in the backyard earlier getting some sun. I noticed my nose got a little red. <laughs> So uh, yeah, just kind of relaxing. I'm actually doing a uh, secret backyard show tonight with a mask on, but uh, yeah, I'm doing that in a couple hours. So uh, oh, okay. yeah, so I'm uh, relaxing before that. So you're going to be on somebody else's show in their backyard? Uh, it's somebody's donating their backyard to have a comedy show tonight. I guess they did something over the 4th of July and it was fun and it was safe. And everybody was doing their part on uh, social distancing and wearing masks, and it wasn't overcrowded. So um, they said it was good, and then so they invited me to come do the show tonight. And I said, absolutely. It sounds like it went good for the fourth. So yeah, count me in. So that's where I'll be tonight. Wonderful. I kept, I kept looking to see if they were going to do any like promoting on social media, and I was like, I guess not. So. Yeah, but yes, I know a lot of cities that are afraid. Yeah, a lot of cities are afraid to promote because of yeah. like the authorities and stuff. So they keep it under underground, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm not going to say where it is or who else I'm going to be performing with or anything. But I mean, I was in Vegas. What was it last week? And I did the first show I've done um since february since before everything was shut down and stuff and that was actually at a local vegas venue there's a guy named jack slammy that um he's been running rooms for years and i love jack um so yeah i did a slammy show and it went awesome and we had a decent turnout and stuff and so yeah that was the first thing i've done since february wow i just missed you because i went to the next slammy show after that oh so you went just a few nights ago Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you just missed me. I was there the week before that. Let me know when you're coming back because I want to come out and support you. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Yep. Hopefully, we'll be able to start ramping things back up here. I don't know. Sometime soon, hopefully. <laughs> anybody's guess, it's like they should take bets on it at the casino. They'd probably make gajillions. If yeah, could... right. <laughs> I mean, they like to gamble. It'd be another good thing to make bets on. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about your early life that led you into comedy. Um, well, let's see. Like early life or like like what made me want to be a comedian or what what fueled me like like the earliest point in your life where you got laughter and said, "Ah, yeah, this is cool." Or you got attention or you kept the bullies away or you got in trouble from the print. When did comedy rear its ugly head on you so i grew up in a household where my dad was kind of always like a ham bone um you know and he was like i get a lot of that that quick wit stuff like that i get a lot of that from him um and also it's like i don't have any brothers and um 
and sorry, my phone, I, I should have turned off my notifications, but, um, no you know, so my, my dad, you know, he was, he was raised in Montana. And so he was just very, like, he raised us like boys. So being raised really tough and like hunting and fishing stuff like that. So it was kind of interesting upbringing for a girl. Um, you know, and my mom was there too, but it's like, she wasn't really big into the, the girly stuff with us. She was right there. You know, but it's like there was always laughter. There was always fun stuff going on. And when I was 14 years old, I saw George Carlin on HBO. And from that moment, I knew I wanted to be a stand-up comedian when I grew up. But I also knew I wanted to wait till I was 30 so I could get some life experiences under my belt. So when I turned 30, I was like, okay, it, it like you've been talking about it since you were 14. So if you're going to do it, do it. So yeah. So I started doing it. And so, yeah, but there was always, I mean, I actually got bullied a lot in school. Um, I was really, really heavy um, through like high school and junior high and stuff. So I um, got bullied a lot. I didn't really know how to stick up for myself. So that kind of gave me the tougher skin. And again, being raised like a boy gave me the tougher skin that now um, I think it prepared me for this type of career. <laughs> So it's like, I tell people all the time, I'm like, you can say whatever you want to me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. And exactly. even when I moved, when I moved from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, they roasted me. And I said, please go as mean as you want, because you're not going to hurt my feelings. And they still didn't go very mean. So when it was my turn to roast back, I was like, well, now I feel kind of bad about the stuff I wrote because you guys didn't even come close, you know? So what but a yeah, bunch of pussies. Exactly. <laughs> bunch of pussies. Thank you. I didn't know how, how uh, <laughs> vulgar I could get on your show. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so we lose a few, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. We're going to lose them anyway, because, you know, politically correct and comedy seem to be on the outskirts and not even essential. So just do it. <laughs> Say what you feel. Well, you know, it's funny, too. Like, every time people go, oh, you're a comedian, I go, just to let you know, I'm dirty. They always go, is there any other kind? And I go, you'd be surprised. Yes. You'd be surprised how many people go, oh, well, you know, I don't like dirty comedy and I think you're more creative if you were clean. And I go, you know what? Whatever appeals to you, whatever, however your mind thinks, it's like, whether it's clean, dirty, what, you know what I mean? It's like, it's whatever. It's yes. what, yeah. People look at me and they go, you know, I should probably be clean on your show. And I'm like, would you quit that? That is so ageist, racist. What is that? <laughs> Just yeah. talk to me. I'm not, I'm telling you, I cuss when I'm home alone and I got hit by a drunk driver. I have a brain injury and I drop oh, things. Geez. I drop things all the time. And, and so when I drop things, I get really pissed and I say cuss words, you know, but my first four and a half years, I wouldn't say one cuss word on stage. And then I wondered why they didn't think I was authentic. <laughs> <laughs> like they can read. People can read if you're be just be yourself. That's yeah, you exactly. Can say just whatever be yourself you and yeah. There should like, be freedom of speech. I think this is America. It was a while ago. Well, and that's the other thing. It's like I briefly ran a show called uh, the First Amendment because. It's like all these people going, oh, well, you can do my show, but you can't say this and you can't talk about this and you can't talk about this. It's like, fuck you. Talk about whatever you want. You know, make sure it has some type of uh, funniness to it, but talk about whatever you want. You know, I it's like a guy like George Carlin. He talked about whatever he wanted because he made it funny. That's right. And it, and it was true. I mean, it, it was all, it wasn't like he was just saying something to be funny. He was trying to get people to wake up. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, he made a damn good point with almost everything he talked about. Yes. I would listen to him more than I would listen to Oprah. If I had to choose who was more woke, Carlin every time. Absolutely. God, can you imagine what he would be saying about this virus and all this shit right now? He would be... He would just be writing and writing and writing and writing. I mean, he would just be coming up with so much stuff and just, yeah, it would be really interesting to see if he was still alive right now, what he would have to say. That would be a really good um, impersonation to do. Yeah, yeah, it would. 
Yeah, Jeffrey Peterson <laughs> should get on that. <laughs> oh, did you see his new haircut? Yes, I love it. It looks I so know, nice. I know, I do too. It does. It's, it looks really nice on him. <laughs> that's going to be a babe magnet. He's going to wind up getting girls that used to be married to military men if he's not careful. Oh, right. I know. He's <laughs> like, don't make me look like a jarhead. I'm like, I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> So you got into comedy. You've been doing it about 11 years. What are some high points in your comedy career, Angie? Um, I'm like, I really don't have it. No, I mean, there was, there was some. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think. I mean, I moved here five and a half years ago. And uh, I just really felt like um, the ball was really going to start rolling for me. And living in L.A., it... Uh, it really doesn't. I mean, it's like it, it's it's you move here thinking like, OK, I know that I'm facing a really, really tough challenge. And it's a thousand times harder than that. Um, you know, like coming up in the scene in Vegas, they're very supportive and they're like, oh, hey, you're funny. I want to introduce you to this person. I want to put you on this show. But then you come out to a place like L.A. and they're like, oh, wow, you're funny. I'm going to blacklist you from my room because I didn't. I, I didn't like that you got more laughs than than I did. Like, it just, it's so weird. So, um, you know, it was cool when um, I started getting uh, more recognition from bigger names. It's cool when uh, clubs started saying, no, we want to book you to headline. Uh, it was cool when I got to the point when, um, you know, I was able to get up on stage and I timed myself and I was like, holy shit, I did 75 minutes and I, you know, like stuff like that. But uh, there was a few really big opportunities that like, like opening for really famous people that um, I briefly had a manager and, um, and I was asked for by name uh, by, for, you know, by these um these famous comics managers and the manager I had at the time said, Oh, she's unavailable and took the gigs. So a lot of the big things that I possibly could have had this son of a bitch took from me. And uh, I really hope karma gets this guy. So yeah, it's like all the big things that I would really like to talk about. They were taken from me. It's like, I just feel that like in a lot of ways, I kind of got fucked, you know, and, <laughs> and didn't I enjoy it. it. Yeah. It's like, I definitely have, plenty of material you know I definitely I mean I'm not trying to sound conceited when I say hey I'm funny it's like but I had their managers asking for me by name and the opportunity got taken away from me more than once and and uh yeah so I, do, I have said some big things happen but uh you know it's just it's more just the experience and and, and like I tell people all the time, they go, what's the best thing you've ever done? And I was like, uh, stand-up comedy. <laughs> stand-up comedy. Like I was telling one of my friends today, I hope nobody listening steals my fucking idea. But um, I was like, yeah. you know what I want to do with the rest of my life? I said, it's not even about wanting to be famous anymore. I said, I would love to buy a boat that's just big enough that I can... Um, basically tour up and down the coastline and just go from city to city and hit shows. Um, and eventually along the way, you know, pick someone up if they say, okay, I have to be in this city by this day. You know, we just go from port to port playing shows and then they eventually get off the boat and somebody else hops on. And then eventually we maybe go through like the Panama Canal and just, so I would love to eventually start going around the world and just make it build and build and just make it like a never ending comedy tour on my boat and just, you know, maybe build from there, but just again, pick up comics and then drop them off and do shows along the way. And I don't know, I just think that would be so awesome and find a way to make money from my laptop. I just, I think that would be so awesome and meeting people and performing all over the world. And again, it's nothing about, becoming famous it's about living on a boat and just relaxing like you're living you're you're living on vacation but you're getting to you know perform and do what you love all the time like that just to me sounds like paradise and I would love to do that for the rest of my life and that's what I want to do for the rest of my life so I love that you can have those opportunities yeah like that's what I want to do that's that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've marked out that I'm going to go for a year around the United States. I don't know how yet, but I know I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. I don't care yeah. if I have to, you know, bark outside of a club to get a five minute spot. I want to 
I want to feel and touch everybody in the United States. I do. Yeah. And you know what? That is something that that is a very, very good goal to have. And that's a that's a very attainable goal. And you could even cross into um, Canada uh, in a lot of in a lot of those spots, too. It's like because that's the cool thing about social media nowadays, because it's like once you're in one place, you know, you meet people that say, hey, you're going here next. I'll put you in contact with these people. You know, it's like a spider web. You know, and then from there you get to the next place. And then from the, you know, it's like, again, the spider webs and then just the connections reach out. So yeah, it's like, you'll be able to get to one side and then back and then up, down. Yeah, it's, that's very attainable. And then I, I will try to help you in any way I can to do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, I don't care if I have to, you know, sleep in a Walmart parking lot in somebody else's car that has broken windows. I'm going to make it happen. I've, I've suffered before it, you know, I'll sleep in parking lots and shower at the YMCA swimming pool. I don't care if it's a goal. Yeah, it's it's a goal. Yeah. So, yeah. So tell me about like some of the places, some of the crazy places you've done. Those are such great stories. What's the goofiest, weirdest, stupidest, hardest, scariest stuff you've been through? Okay, so I will say off the top of my head, the craziest place I got to perform at, it was two summers ago, and it was a um, clothing optional campground in Minnesota, and, <laughs> um, and it, uh, me and a friend of mine got booked for a thing called uh, Swingstock, and it was Woodstock for Swingers. So when I got on stage, there was like 400 naked people in the audience. <laughs> so um, I, and it was everywhere from, I mean, you had to be 21 to get in, but it was ages 21 to like 80, you know, it was, yeah. And uh, all body shapes, you know, all shapes and sizes. Um, I have a joke that I talk about how men name their dicks, but women don't name their vaginas. So the merchandise that I sell, I have a couple pictures on my Facebook stuff, but I have a, um, the merchandise I sell, it's like the boy short underwear. And um, it's got, you know, like you go to a seminar and there's the sticker that says, hello, my name is. So that's printed on the front. And so you can purchase these after the show and you can, you know, come to the Sharpie so you can name your junk or whatever. And so I had a pair of those on underneath my dress. So... I lifted up my dress, you know, cause when in Rome, I lifted up my dress and I go, Hey, does anybody want to come up here and sign our name mine? And everybody just like flooded the stage. It was probably about 10 or 12 people. And like, you know, so the first one up there was this woman and I was like, all right, all right. You were the first one up here. Fair enough. Come on up. So she's down there writing on it and she tried to, she tried to eat me out on stage. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I said, hey, 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 hey. I said, no, no, let me finish what I, I got contracted to come here and do, you know? I was like, so, and I can't even remember what she wrote on them. I've got them around here somewhere. Um, so yeah, it's like, so that was the craziest thing, the cra craziest place I've ever performed, craziest thing I've ever had happen to me on stage. Um, of course I provoked it. Um, <laughs> Also, when I first started doing stand-up, um, me and a friend of mine, Miracle, she was already a comic. She taught me how to do stand-up. Wow. And we had a friend named Tadri. Tadri's a drag queen. Um, Tadri would always go to this swingers club in Vegas called the Power Exchange. Well, somehow Tadri talked to them about getting a comedy night going there. So we started running an open mic there at this swingers club in vegas and so we would always do it in this room they actually built a stage for us it was a two-story one it was pretty big it was over by the rio and uh so we would do that i think on like wednesday nights or something and then we would do a showcase i think on like thursday or fridays but we would always open and do our show before the club opened and the club the club would open while our show was going on so they could come in and watch our show, but there was no sex or nudity allowed while our show was going on. But I tell you what, when our show was over, we saw some pretty freaky shit in that club happen. Um, but yeah, I want to say that club thing lasted maybe only like eight months, maybe a year. 
Um, but again, it's like people don't want to really come to a comedy show at a uh, swingers club. No. Um, some nights it was more popular. Some nights it wasn't. I'm trying to think like other places. I, I mean, it's like, you know, you do your fair share of coffee shops and it's like, hey, I'm not going to get up there and tell my dirty material. Well, there's a family sitting over here, you know, like at a restaurant or something. It's like, no, like I've actually backed out of shows. I'm like, hey, I'm like, I can't get up there and tell. I mean, and this is this was back when I all I had was dirty stuff. Like now I could get up there and play around and, you know, and be able to tell jokes even with kids in the audience. They still wouldn't understand it. It'd be edgy, you know, but um, so, yeah, I'm trying to think, but it's like those ones are the ones that are sticking out in my mind the most. Yeah, while, I mean, you're only... think, while you're thinking, I'll tell you about one that I, that I was involved in. I started a comedy and tell me when to stop because I'll stop as soon as you think of another. I started comedy at a coffee shop in Portland, Oregon, like on okay. 30, 30th and 37th and Division. And is a coffee shop run by Iranians. So everything on the wall is Iranian based. They were, the people were, and everybody would come in there to put headphones on and work on their laptops and okay. sit, with their, sit with their backs to the stage when it was comedy day. They were not there wow. for the silent <laughs> protest, passive aggressive bullshit. And so the best thing, I started this mic. I got the gig, I hired the people. We had a weekly mic. And it was the worst environment to do comedy. You know, it was one of them. And right. It was so rewarding when you could get somebody to shut their laptop and un take off their headphones and turn around and listen. You knew you had right. some serious, oh, yeah. but pretty much, you know, a lot of people didn't know how to play to that audience, you know? Yeah. And you just like have to just bring it even harder because they will shut their laptop and turn around if they see that the rest of the people are he's they're missing something well vegas is like that um i ran a show in vegas for it was at a, a bar called meatheads and it was an open mic and that, that was um when i was brand new to comedy i was talking about my friend miracle i was brand new to comedy this guy asked us if we would run an open mic there and it was this tiny little dive bar well it ended up becoming so popular we had to add a second night so we ran that for um, well, I, I will say she ended up having a baby. So she ended up, uh, you know, backing out kind of early on. Um, but you know, it's like, she taught me a lot and it, it ended up becoming so popular. We added the second night. I think we did it for six or seven years. Um, but again, uh, with the gaming, people are always just involved in their machine and they're, you know, and it was one of those long skinny bars. And it was just kind of open up in the back a little bit. And we had a, a carpet and a microphone with a mic stand. I mean, and that was, that was it. And the owner would come in and he loved to play um, sound effects on his laptop. So if you were doing bad, he'd play crickets or he'd do like the, the rim shot after you dropped a joke. And, and some of the comics would be like, could you tell him not to fucking do that when I'm up here trying to work on stuff? And so I don't know, but after a while, it just became kind of like a staple of Las Vegas. And it was a fun room. And sometimes I, I sit here and I go, man, I miss that little open mic. Like we had so much fun there. And so many comics in Vegas got their start in my shitty little open mic. And we did, we had so much fun. But again, if you could actually get someone to stop what they're doing and turn around from their machine, or like, I can't tell you how many times people would start talking in the back of the room and you'd have to get on the microphone and go, shut the fuck up. It's a comedy night. You want to talk, go outside. But if somebody's up there doing good and getting laughs, everybody quiets down because they're like, what, what, what? Somebody's getting laughs. Oh, we're missing out on the funny. Then they shut the hell up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I love that. We did comedy in Portland at Dante's, which they, the young people don't know it, but it used to be a strip club and far more, if you know what I mean, wink, wink. It was, <laughs> the gang, there were shootings there, gangster activity. I mean, in the 60s, Portland was the Wild West. And oh, okay. <laughs> so now they call it a bar, but I know the history of the place. So uh, when I went to the mic there, I wore like 50,000 layers of clothes and told them every time, this is a strip club from the 60s, so... Every time I tell a joke, if you laugh, I take off a layer of clothing, right? Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was awesome. no way. I mean, it was so fun to 
you know, get those people that they, it's funny how people go to a club and don't even know what the history of the place. I'm old enough to know. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to bring it back, you know, <laughs> for good well, times. And, um, I mean, something like that would be perfect for Vegas. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, even in Vegas, there's a lot of, uh, I, I, there was a place that was kind of over by the Mandalay Bay on the other side of the 15. I noticed that they tore it down, but they have tried to turn that place into so many different things, but it's so haunted <laughs> that it never succeeds. So they ended up just tearing the place down. And, um, and I think it has something to do with like, they're going to be putting the Raiders stadium over near there too. But, um, but it's not where the stadium's going to be. Like the, the, the establish, establishment could have stayed, but I've seen it on plenty of like ghost shows and stuff that, uh, that that place, again, it's tried to be many things over the years. And I can't remember what it was originally, but so many people, I think it's back from like the mobster days or something, but it's been so many different things. I mean, so many people died there originally that they can't have a successful business there. Wow, so that's crazy. The damn place down, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever gone on a ghost a ghost tour where they have the equipment that you can monitor ghost activity? Well, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, through the whole quarantine, um, I was dating a guy. We actually just broke up like I don't know two months ago, maybe. But um, we got into watching um, a show called Haunted Hospitals and another one called Paranormal Caught on Tape or something like that. So I was like scaring the shit out of myself on purpose to the point where if he wasn't here i was sleeping with my bedroom light on because that's how bad i was scaring myself and so then what do i do i buy a ouija board and an emf reader now i haven't, <laughs> I haven't yeah so i haven't used them yet they're sitting in the spare bedroom and every time people come over i had one of my friends over today and um and i said hey i said you ever played around with the ouija board nope don't want to never will Every single person that's came over, you want to play around this Ouija board? Nope, don't want you, never will. Because I live in a 60-year-old house and um, people like you can feel a, a, an, an, ener an energy in this house. And I've had people say that they've seen my aunt in the, the, um, the bathroom mirror. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a bathroom in the hallway for the other bedrooms. So they've said that they've seen my aunt in that hallway mirror. Cause my aunt died. My aunt died in the bedroom that I have, but she died of old age. It's not like she was murdered or anything, but yeah. So you can feel the energy of the house. So I was like, you know, it'd be interesting to see what we could pick up with on the EMF reader and a Ouija board. But he and I ended up breaking up by the time the Ouija board came in and now nobody will play with the fucking Ouija board with me. And I'm not afraid of attracting, like I actually started working on something and uh, I might play around with it tonight, but I was like, okay, I was like, ghosts or rats? What would you rather have in your house? And everybody's like, ghosts. And I was like, yeah, but the one person that says rats, imagine what their ghost experience is. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's funny. Like, yeah, I was like, they probably had to deal with like a fucking exorcism or something. But yeah, it's like, cause we had to deal with rats and ghosts. And it's like, oh, hell yes. I'd rather have fucking ghosts in this house. So. <laughs> I lived in an apartment with my daughter. I was a single mom. And one night she woke up screaming and claimed there was a guy on fire at the foot of her bed. What? So, turns out that unit had burnt to the ground and a man died in the fire. Oh my gosh. How old was she? She, that would have been when she was like 14, 15. Wow. Um, when I do your hair, we're going to have to talk about this kind of stuff more. I know we're supposed yes. to talk about comedy and stuff right. more, but it's, People it's kind get of tired so of, fascinating. Yeah, we have other things in our lives, you guys. You know, like, for instance, you don't know what kind of things Angie collects or what her passion is of, aside from comedy or what her favorite color is. How are you going to know if you want to support Angie Crumb if you don't get to know her behind her mask, so to speak? So yes, I know, what, right? What are some things about you that people might not be aware of? Uh, you know what? I was just talking to a friend of mine about this today. Um, I like to meditate a lot. Um, about 12 years ago, meditation saved my life. I used to be a really angry person. And uh, meditation saved my life. I'm very, my dad passed away last year. 
Sorry. Um, I, and that's another reason why I've gotten more into like ghosts and things like that. Um, Cause I feel them around me all the time. I've seen um, two blue orbs and two white orbs since he's died. And it's not like it's some like, whoa, what was that? Like I'll be laying in bed and I can't sleep and like just something just do, 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 do. And I rub my eyes and it's still fucking there. Like um, See, there's a white orb that just appeared. Yeah. Yeah. Right, just now, right like, now. No, right now. Oh, when really? You, well, that might, just, start... that might be the, my curtains are blowing and the sun is on this oh. side of the house. It's just it, weird that it happened the minute you said that. Yeah, so again, it could have been, it could have been, but like, um, just, I don't know, a lot of weird stuff uh, like that. I've been getting into that more and more in the past like year, year and a half. Um, what else do you guys want to know? I love my dogs. Now, here's the thing. Everybody knows me as some crazy party girl because that's what everybody sees when I go out in Vegas. Hell yeah, okay, everybody. Now I'll go like a month at least a month sometimes and it won't even touch alcohol a lot of people don't even know this about me they think that i'm drinking and boozing it up and all this stuff all the time no you guys see what i want you to see most of the time i come home i'll go days and like even when the coronavirus stuff happened i loved it i took a social distance from social media i have a girl that runs my instagram so i didn't even have to worry about that but yeah it's like I am very much a recluse as much as I am a social butterfly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like, uh, and so people just have this perception of me, but uh, the person that I really am is completely different from that. So people don't see that side of me until I, I let them. And yeah. even that's what my friend said today. And he goes, wow, he goes, I've never seen this side of you. And I go, well, people always see me when I'm out. So they see that side of me. They just think I'm some big party animal and, that's not who I am. But when I'm out and I decide to drink, you bet your ass I want to have some drinks, you know. I guess I'm making up for lost time or something. But yeah, <laughs> like, when I decide to go out, I, I like to have a good time. But then I walk away from it like I never even did it, you know. Exactly. Um, what else? I have two dogs that I love very much. What kind of dogs? One of them is, uh, one of them just walked up to my sliding glass door right now. She's half Labrador and half Chihuahua. I call her a chab. <laughs> so come on, my little baby. Um, and then my other one is a blue healer, a Queensland blue healer. Wow. Um, that one is 15 and she has gone um, completely blind over the years. Yeah, yeah, she's 15 and a half now. She's gone blind over the years. But yeah, I've had her since she was a puppy and she is the best damn dog anybody could have ever asked for. And she's so smart. Um, both of them, they're both very smart. So I love my dogs. I'm never going to have children. These are my kids. Come here. Come on, Polly. Beautiful. I love animals. Yeah, my me too. My favorite dog is a beagle. I have to find me a beagle. Oh, I love beagles. Me too. Love beagles. They bark sometimes too much, but I love beagles. They yeah. do. Where can people follow you, Angie, to help your numbers on the internet? So Facebook, Angie Crum, everybody, K-R-U-M, no B. I, I have to emphasize K-R-U-M. Um, and then on Instagram, it's all one word, at Crum Shots. Um, and Twitter's the same thing, but I... I never use my Twitter. I never go on there. My Instagram girl said as soon as she gets my Instagram where she wants it, uh, she's going to start working on my Twitter. And um, I don't have anything on YouTube right now. Uh, every time I put something up, I have somebody contact me going, hey, I'm doing this show in, you know, I heard somebody say New Hampshire, Florida, Missouri. And they're like, so, uh, somebody was telling one of your jokes word for word. So I, when I put stuff up, I have to fucking take it down. And I'm like, here's the thing. It's not like somebody is telling a joke that's really similar to mine because everything I tell on stage is a true story. Like I've been blessed to have a crazy enough life that when, when I'm up there telling is something that actually happened to me. So if I wanted to say somebody like, hey, why don't you tell me how that happened to you? Because there's no way in hell that it happened to you too. You know, exactly. and so when somebody's telling it that closely, I'm like, you know, and I'm just going to take the shit off the fucking room. And then people go, oh, well, if somebody's going to steal your material, then just let them have it. And I'm like, no, it's not like I wrote the joke. It's actually something that happened to me. Like, I started writing a book. It's called Crumbs in the Bed. 
And it's all about my crazy freaking life, but it has a lot of crazy sex stories in there because for some reason I'm like fly paper for the fucking freaks out there. Wow. <laughs> so do you do a podcast? You've got a great voice. You're interesting to talk to. Thank you. Um, you know, years ago, I actually was hired by a brand new internet radio uh, station and uh, it was called Mint Music. And it didn't last very long. They didn't, I don't know, they didn't set enough aside enough money for advertising. And so it only lasted a few months and then they had to fire me and all the other female DJs. Um, but yeah, I had my own show on there. It was called Crumb and Get It. And it was a really fun show. And so I have thought about starting up a podcast or something again. I mean, I've got a spare room that I thought about um, you know, making that into some type of a studio or something. So yeah, it has been crossing my mind, especially. <laughs> it froze up. We didn't hear anything you said since you talked about your bedroom. Oh, I said the spare bedroom. I could, uh, I said, I thought about turning that into like, um, um, like a podcast studio or something like that, especially with all the coronavirus stuff. And yeah, I hear that all the time. People go, oh, you've got a great voice. Do you do radio? Uh, people always ask if I'm a singer, stuff like that. So yeah, it, especially lately, I've thought about doing radio more. And do you sing? Uh, only in the shower. Okay. Because <laughs> I hadn't thought that you were a singer, but I definitely thought you'd be perfect for a podcast or as a, you know, like a host of a show. And you know what? I've emceed a lot of things. Um, every time, like I'm with all the backstage LA casting actors access. So every time I see like even a TV show or something like that, they're looking for a host. I submit for everything. Sorry, that sun is coming through kind of weird. No problem. Okay. I need to be, I need to get off of here and go, but okay. now, but you were officially a graduate of the comic spot. So you're all on right. the same, same level as Sinbad. All so right. <laughs> I got to do that with my hands too. Yeah. yeah. So when you, <laughs> when you graduate from comic spot, that means every month you can come back and plug something for five or seven minutes. Sweet. So any, anytime hit me up. I'm here for you. Okay. Well, Hey, when you're ready to go across the country, you let me know and I'll uh, let you know where I have my strongest connections and we'll help you map that out. Thank you. I could use that help because that's Absolutely. one the only part about my brain brain that isn't fully repaired is organizing things. Sometimes that's a real, it wears, I can do it. It just takes uh -huh. me five, five, 10 times as long as it might take you. So yeah, uh -huh. I could use uh -huh. some help. Thank you for having me. And I'll Thank message you, you about um, doing your hair when I come in yes, and please. Week for the week after or whatever. And then we can talk about that then. Yes. And I'm going to put out this video version. This is un, this is just the raw audio uh, audio. And then in about one to two and a half days, Adam Dominguez will put his magic touch on it and we'll come back out looking like a sitcom. Oh, right on. So then I'll send that to you privately for you to share the professional one. Okay, very cool. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed getting to know you, Angie Crumb. You guys, follow her, help her, watch Thank when she's so much, coming everybody. and go yeah. out and support her. Yes. I'm up and, and crumbing. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Angie Crumb. Right, Thank you Love so you much. Lots. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. 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 Everybody's talking at the comic spot. The comic spot.